Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm happy that you are here and uh, stayed until the end. I hope you are not too tired. We have an interesting topic to cover. Uh, so, uh, I am Ivan Kavulgiev. A bit more about me. I'm an architect in uh, Wimechain. Uh, we are a service company which develops uh, Web2 solutions, um, developing networks and also applications over blockchains, which are called DApps, decentralized applications. And um, a bit more about me. I accept programming. I love uh, analog uh, stuff like uh, vinyl and analog photography. So the topic f for today is um, making some examples of how Java can be utilized in the blockchain domain. Uh, but before that, I had to disappoint you for something. That's something we won't be able to cover today. Uh, we would focus on technology, so let's see our agenda. We would cover what is uh, DOT, which is distributed ledger technology, what's blockchain, how we can interact with it, why we need it, uh, what are smart contracts, we would see their importance. Then we would have three demos about uh, having a special module called TVM, then we would run an Ethereum node built on Java locally, and then we can interact with uh, a whole network developed on Java, which is called Hedera. And our company participates in the development of this uh, network. So after each demo, we might have uh, time for one or two questions. Uh, but let's get started. Um, so I can start with a personal story. A couple of years ago, um, I was working for a banking uh, software, building enterprise uh, uh, software and my main t tech stack is Java so um, that w that's what I was working but then I got interested in blockchain I started reading uh, more articles about it get into the ecosystem and I was uh, wondering uh, now that I'm a Java developer but I want to build something in blockchain is that possible and I understood that uh, my current company has a tech stack which uh, has Java, so that was wonderful. And uh, we can explore that uh, having the benefits of Java, which is uh, enterprise-friendly language, very uh, robust one, it's uh, very secure, uh, performant, it's agnostic of the hardware we run. We can combine all of these benefits with something new, having applications in the blockchain domain. Uh, but why blockchain? Why we need it? Um, as everything, internet also had uh, some evolution. It currently does. So in the 80s and 90s, when internet appeared, we had static uh, pages, only read-only access to the pages. And with uh, Web2, which appeared in the beginning of 2000s, we started interacting with each other, having social media, streaming services, more dynamic content. Uh, but then we lost something, which is... Uh, our personal data could be stored and used for an appropriate purposes. We, had, we have now centralized organizations which can use this data. And then Web3 appeared. It, it's a web uh, movement which uh, is built on blockchain. And we can have self-governed uh, organizations or applications. They don't need any authority. We can have personal digital assets like uh, NFTs. Have you heard about NFTs? Okay. Uh, we don't have any middlemen in the execution of the transactions we want to make. We are transparent, have a public address, and uh, uh, we can anonymously uh, participate in the network. So, how many of you know DOT as a technology? Okay, and uh, how many of you think DOT and blockchain are different things? Okay, <laughs> so uh, DOT stands for Distributed Ledger Technology. Uh, it's built on a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Basically, we have a couple of nodes which interact with each other. They can receive or send data. Uh, the key point is that the data in this uh, network is distributed among all of the nodes. And we can have all of the information spread across the whole network. 
And to be secure, these uh, networks use consensus algorithms. Uh, and whenever we make a transaction into such a system, uh, it stays immutable. The transaction can be modified. And we don't have any central authority which can uh, block or change something uh, in the transaction process. So then what is blockchain? It's actually the most famous type of DOT. It uh, gets all of these characteristics, but uh, has something additional. That's the way in which we store the data in this network, which is in box. So we put transactions, bundle them in a block. And each block has a cryptographic uh, connection to a previous block. And that's how we can have a chain of box. And the structure itself in which we keep the um, data is called blockchain, and the network itself gathers the same name based on the name of the structure. So uh, we don't have only blockchains, but other types of DOT technologies. But today we would stop only on two of them, which are blockchain and hash graph. Uh, the first, on, in the beginning I mentioned Hedera, which is a Java-based DOT network. It's actually a hash graph which has a different uh, type of uh, uh, making the consensus algorithm storing the data. Uh, on the right, we can see we have some lines. Each line represents a node in the system. And the higher we get, the more time is progressing. And the circles are actually events. When we make a transaction to the system, um, this transaction is bundled in an event. An event can have one or more transactions. This event is then gossiped by the node which received the transaction to um, another node in a random manner. And uh, exponentially, very fast, the whole network can understand about the event. And uh, a given event has a hash for a previous event. And that's how we can have um, a graph of all of these events. And uh, the mechanism in which the system works is called uh, gossip about gossip. And since the events form a graph and the information inside is hashed, that's why it's called hash graph. Uh, but we would cover this uh, later. So how we can interact with blockchain? We described the structure, what, what is the blockchain, but how we can use it. If we uh, imagine that we have a simple web application, like uh, uh, nowadays uh, we have a lot of uh, examples for this, it's usually built in JavaScript with front-end and back-end in Node.js, for example, then we should just substitute the node, the, um, the back-end part which communicates with a single node currently with the blockchain. Uh, so how we do this? In a lot of uh, networks, uh, JSON-RPC protocol is utilized, especially in Ethereum. So if the backend of our application performs JSON-RPC requests to a specific provider or smart wallet, then this provider uh, under the hood would uh, communicate with the blockchain. So we should just switch the ports and the URLs of our program and uh, perform different types of RPC calls but the provider would uh, do a lot of uh, the complications for us. And uh, MetaMask is a, is an example of smart wallet. Uh, under the hood, uh, it uses providers like uh, Infura, and another provider, so um, Infura or Alchemy. So these are companies which have their own nodes in Ethereum. You interact with them, and their nodes propagate your transaction to the whole network. It's gossiped around. The consensus algorithm validates your transaction, and eventually it's put in box. Uh, but we will see some examples in the demo. So we would cover three demos, uh, as I mentioned. The first one is uh, an EVM, which is uh, built on Java, and we will see what is an EVM. Then running a node and a whole network, we would increase the scope of our demo. And after each demo, we might have like one or two questions uh, if you have after the demo. So uh, to make the demos, I decided to use uh, smart contract. And why is that? Uh, that's essentially what makes blockchains to be um, 
viewed as a global computers, since smart contracts can have automatic rules which can be applied directly. Uh, and uh, for example, if we are for exa in a bookstore and we want to buy a book, we take a book and go to the pay desk. It's count, we pay for it, and we get it. Uh, the, how this can be done in the digital world, in the smart contract case, we can have predetermined automatic rules. So for example, if you pay a given uh, cryptocurrency for the book, uh, the smart contract can see if there are available books in our network. If so, directly we can get one without a, a middleman. So this is just a simple example how autonomous uh, blockchains can work and smart contract can utilize the execution of business logic. So we write these smart contracts in a special high-level language called Solidity. Uh, it's human readable language, similar to Python, Java, and JavaScript. As you can see in the example, we have a greeter contract, which can be interpreted as a Java class relatively. And this code is uh, then compiled to bytecode. It's stored in the blockchain data uh, storage. And then uh, this code is stored at a specific address. So when we call the address in which this contract is uh, deployed, and we say what uh, method we want to execute, it will be executed for us. So let's see how we can uh, deploy and use the smart contract. To do this, uh, we have a special uh, module which is very important. It's called the Ethereum Virtual Machine. Originally, uh, this is a virtual machine built for Ethereum, but it's also used in other, applica uh, in other networks. So it's a runtime environment to deploy and run smart contracts. It's a Turing complete uh, virtual machine, so it can uh, execute all type of mathematical operations. It uses a stack approach, so we can push and pop data on the stack of the EVM. The EVM itself has a memory uh, storage, so it can temporarily write uh, data to this uh, memory. We have deterministic results. Whatever is uh, put as an input, we get the same output if the input is the same. And each node of a blockchain network has the EVM integrated in itself. So when we make a transaction to the blockchain, it's eventually executed in every single node of this uh, network. And that's how the nodes update their own storage. So they do it by themselves. And um, another example which I can give is like having a car, which, uh, uh, as you know, has an engine. So the EVM is an engine of, a, for example, Ethereum node. Without an engine, we can't uh, move it. We can't execute anything. It would be just a facade. So having the smart contract from the previous slide, we can use a special compiler which interprets Solidity, and we have a bytecode, which is an init, um, called init bytecode since it has some instructions to initialize the initial state of the contract. The EVM takes this init bytecode and uh, uh, makes special uh, operations over it, and uh, after everything is executed, it's initialized, we get a more a smaller bytecode called the runtime bytecode. That's the bytecode which is kept in the state and used for the executions of the smart contract. We need the init bytecode only for the deploy. And the second type, the runtime bytecode, is stored in the blockchain. And the transaction about the deploy is kept in a box. And the runtime bytecode itself is kept in the storage. So time for our uh, first demo. We would use uh, Java-based EVM, which is part of a repository called uh, Bezu. Uh, Bezu is an open source execution client, but I will tell you more in the second demo. So inside it, we have a package uh, called EVM, and we can say all of the Java uh, implementations and all of the components of this uh, module. What's important is is that it works on uh, specific opcodes. Uh, each instruction in the EVM has a corresponding 
opcode. And for example, we can see the crate. I will zoom a bit. So DVM has like more than 100 uh, opcodes. And for each of them, we have a special uh, Java implementation, which can be seen on the left. So for our demo, I would run a special uh, command line interface for interacting with DVM. So I will skip all of the hassle about uh, signing the transaction, populating all of the needed fields for a transaction, just communicate with DVM itself. So I will have to open my cheat sheet to save some time. So I will explain each parameter here and zoom. I have pointed the path to the CLI um, tool. Uh, it seems I can't zoom, but the, the one input here is the code we want to run. So this is the runtime byte code. We have a code parameter section and then an input which tells us what method we want to execute. But how we can uh, take these values? Uh, there is an online Solidity uh, ID for developing uh, smart contracts. Uh, here is the smart contract which I prepared for the demo. So yeah, it has one method with, with a simple operation, but Seems I can't zoom the. the screen. Basically, we have one single method called multiply simple numbers. I'm not sure you can see it. And internally, it multiplies two by two. So, having this solidity file, uh, we can compile it. And we can have a specific version and then. Um, we have compilation details, so we need the runtime byte code in our example, which can be taken from this section. It's on the bottom. The compiler has uh, interpreted our smart contract. And for the uh, function, we have a list of hashes for the function we want to invoke. Uh, so, oh. okay, I was able to zoom. So this is the uh, signature of the method and we use a special cryptographic function which takes the string of the signature and make a hash of the function selector. So this is called a function selector and we want to uh, execute the, if we want to execute the contract we should point this uh, selector and I will get back to the contract so that you can see the method. That's the contract we want to deploy. So having now the CLI with these parameters, we would execute it and receive an output, which is uh, a hex representation of the result, which is four, which is correct. And if we want to get more insights of what is happening inside the Bezui VM, we can put a JSON argument and we will have a stack of uh, traces of all opcodes which were executed to get the result. So we have a, a set of several operations. Each of them is represented with a Java class. And yeah, you can um, see more information about DVM. It's very interesting. And it's also used in the Hedera project, which I mentioned. So it's not used um, only in Ethereum. Um, yeah, any questions about the first demo? Probably, yes? Uh, okay, the question was, what are these operations? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the byte code, the runtime byte code has um, hex uh, interpretation of uh, all the opcodes inside so we have a special web page about uh, all of the EVM codes which are available in the EVM. For each of them, we have Java representation. And 
when we execute a method against the bytecode, the bytecode has all of the instructions what operations it should uh, perform. For example, call, then pop, push. These are different types of operations. These are encoded inside the bytecode. So that's why it's runtime bytecode, since it has all of the paths and uh, ways to execute given operations. And internally, the DVM has a special uh, counter. It knows to which opcode to execute, then what's the next. We have jump operations. We can jump on random places in the bytecode. So that's how this information is encoded in the bytecode. Uh, that's why it's important. OK, so we can, yes? Yeah, uh, so mm -hmm. yes. Um, so to perform operations in the blockchain, we should pay a certain amount of gas. This is so um, we pay for the computation of the node, for the consensus algorithm and the execution itself. So transactions in the blockchain are paid with specific gas fee. And each opcode um, has its own gas cost to be executed. And uh, we can see in the JSON that, uh, for example, we have opcode 86 with this gas. It's in a hex value. It can be interpreted in a numeric value. So we sum all of the opcodes which are executed. Each of them has guess value. And the end result is the guess we should pay for the transaction. So the more complicated it is, the more things it has, it will be more expensive. And that's how the price is determined. And that's vital part of the blockchain uh, interaction. Yes? Oh, you mean, yeah, this one. Um, yeah. For the refund, I can check after the presentation and get back to you. Yes? Mm -hmm. Um so it's to the uh to the whole network there's a special um addresses which can receive uh, this value and um yeah, usually a single node is chosen to be uh, at random principle to be the first one to take the transaction and um it can have a an account assigned to it, and usually this account gets the, the fee. But every time we execute the transaction, different nodes can take the transaction. So it's used in a random principle, but uh, we have an account assigned to the node. And yeah. But yeah, after the talk, we can. Uh, discuss in more details the topic. Okay, I will uh, continue with the other demos since we won't have enough time. So we saw what is a EVM. It's the core uh, module which executes the transactions. Then what if we want to run a local Ethereum node? Um, a couple of years ago, Ethereum used a consensus algorithm called proof of work. And uh, there we needed only one client called uh, the execution client, which uh, took the transactions, executed them, and uh, also validated box. But uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Ethereum migrated to proof of stake consensus algorithm, which is a bit more complicated. We don't won't get into details, but 
currently to run an Ethereum node, you need two types of clients, execution client and consensus client. And Bezu is a Java-based open source execution client, and Teku is an open source Java-based consensus client. And we can see um, what are their responsibilities. Basically, each client has its own peer-to-peer -peer network with which to communicate. And uh, we can think of the consensus client as the heart of the system. That's what is uh, keeping the system uh, working and uh, producing blocks, validating blocks. And the execution client can be uh, thought of as a brain of the system. That's where the EVM is um, uh, put and uh, where we um, execute the transactions. So basically, the execution client takes transactions, bundles them in a block, and uh, via special engine API, these clients communicate a lot with each other, and this block is propagated to the consensus client, and it wraps it in another block with additional parameters, and then this block can be propagated to the peer-to-peer -peer consensus layer, which would uh, validate the block which is on the top. But from user perspective, um, we communicate with the execution client, with the JSON RPC protocol, and um, we can use REST API to communicate with the consensus client, but usually uh, that's done by the consensus client themselves. We want to interact with the execution client. They receive the transaction and they uh, put it in a block. We can see some more internals there. As you can see on the bottom, the execution client has the EVM, which I showed you in the first demo. It also keeps the state of the network, the Ethereum state. So the state can consist of different things, like uh, the accounts in the network, different tokens, how much balance does a given account has for a given token, the contract bytecodes, as we discussed. Everything is uh, kept and manipulated in the execution client. We have a transaction mempool which receives transactions. That's the place where they first end up when we want to interact with the blockchain. And on the top, we can see the consensus client. It's part of the so-called beacon chain, which uh, th uh, that's the place where we have all of the box connected. And we have beacon state for the, the box themselves, and we can search for older box. They're connected with hashes, so we can know for a given period of time, which blocks were uh, produced there. And it handles ex uh, entirely the validation process of the box. So for the second demo, I will first run uh, a Bezu execution client, which we sh saw. Initially, we, sh uh, we saw the EVM, but now I will run the execution client itself. We have a main class, and we should put some parameters. Just a second. So we would use a local uh, client and a local network. So we won't sync with a public network like uh, Sepoli, Go Early, or Mainnet. Usually in blockchains, we have different type of public networks. Mainnet, which is the main one, with where we pay with real money to execute transactions on the main state. But we also have public test networks, like Sepoli, GoWarly, which are used for, um, not entirely for testing, but uh, having new features deployed, measuring performance, and other things. But uh, if I put a Sepoli uh, uh, network here, the consensus, the execution client Bezu will start to sync up. And after uh, this, if it's in a sync status, it won't be able to receive uh, transactions. And here we want to interact with the execution client. That's why, uh, that's why I put a local network. So let's run it. And uh, I have put an option to enable the JSON RPC endpoints to be exposed and uh, also to be mining box. So now it would start creating uh, empty box. We have a special block miner Java class, and we can see that it's running. 
and I have prepared a special uh, small repository where we can interact with this execution client. Uh, but before this, I want to show you something interesting. So this is the repository. And we have the same smart contract which was in the beginning. What we can do is uh, make some resource files based on the Solidity file. We would use now a soul C compiler, which is a bit different from the remix we sold. We have different types of compilers. We point to the uh, Solidity file, and then we'll, we would generate uh, two new resources. The first one is a JSON representation of the methods of the contract. We have currently only one, which is this multiply simple numbers. We have the inputs and outputs defined. And the second one is the initialization bytecode. So having now these generated resources in this folder, we will generate a Java representation of the smart contract, which is really cool. This is done by a special library called Web3J, and it has a CLI part. We would use the CLI. We point to the resources we generated, an output folder, and the package where we want to have the file generated. So here we have a Java representation of the smart contract, which make it uh, more easy for Java developers to interact with the smart contract. We have uh, the init byte code, the method, and some helper methods. Now that we have generated the Java interpretation of the smart contract, we can interact with the execution client we started locally. It's still running under the hood. Um, the execution client has a port exposed for the RPC connections, which is in my case, 8544, we should use a test account uh, to authorize the transaction. Here I have um, yes, use a simple uh, test account, uh, but it's important to remember, remember to never share your private key. It's like sharing the, a key from your house and you can be robbed. So that's just for testing purposes. We have the function name we want to invoke, and what we would do is uh, again uh, deploy the smart contract in the, using the execution client and the EVM inside, and then invoke the method and see the results. So having the Java-generated smart contract interpretation of the smart contract, we would deploy it with the generated method. After this, we would give get the transaction receipt, which is often the case in blockchain. After you make an operation, usually there is a receipt and some um, affirmation that the operation is executed and you can get some metadata about it. Then we can take the contract address, the address in at which place we put the bytecode of the contract. It would be in the receipt. Then we would define a Web3J function object with the function name we want to invoke. And we should uh, generate a raw transaction. That's the, actually the, the transaction we would send to the Ethereum node to execute the method. But it takes a couple of parameters, one of which is the encoded format of the function we constructed. Uh, that's called code data, and uh, it's passed as an argument. Also, we have some values for the, the gas price we want to use, gas limit, etc. but we won't get into details. We have the contract address, at which address we want to invoke this uh, method, uh, which information is encoded in the code data, and uh, additional transaction count, which is called uh, nuns value, it describes how much transactions the user has made, and it's used for uh, saving us from duplicating the same transaction. Whenever we make a transaction, this counter is increased by one, and it's kept in the account state. And we also uh, put this value in the raw transaction. 
finally, we should sign it. That's how we authorize ourselves, and uh, uh, th this uh, signing would be this signature would be checked by the Ethereum node, and then uh, we would use JSON RPC method called each central transaction. But Web3J does this uh, automatically for us. It's built inside the library. And this is actually the RPC call used to send a transaction to the Ethereum, to a blockchain network, uh, especially Ethereum. And then we would get a response and the transaction hash from it. And uh, as a final, I have put a simple way to do all of this hassle just to invoke the generated Java method, which we get uh, from the um, Web2J COI tool, which I showed. We call the method and uh, you send, and we get back the result of the contract. So let's run the demo, and I will show you something additionally. We would get here the contract call hash from the transaction received, the the result of the function and other fields. It would take some time. So we have the hash for the contract deploy and the contract call and the transaction count, which means I have made 33 transactions with this test account uh, before the demo. And let's see uh, what we can do if we have the contract call transaction hash. As I mentioned, we can interact with the execution client via JSON RPC. And let's see if I can zoom. We can use, for example, Postman and uh, the URL and the port which we have run the client. We can perform JSON RPC requests. Here we have a list of uh, different RPC calls we can, which we can make. And we can put the transaction hash we have and get the result, which, um, for example, have, has the block number in which the transaction ended up in. I'm not sure how well you can see, but you can check the recording after that. We have uh, some meta information about the transaction, and we can interact with the execution client with this um, with these Postman requests. And for example, we can also take the block number and execute it block by number, another JSON RPC request used for reading, and we can fetch the block in which we uh, put the transaction in. So the whole, currently we have only one execution client, but typically a whole network would uh, decide in which block the transaction would end up in. Again, we have some metadata about the block and a list of transactions. Currently we have only one. So that was the first part of this second demo. And what I want to show now is something else. I will stop the local instance of uh, the execution client and I will uh, switch the execution client to now point to Sepolia network which should be interesting so basically a couple of um, parameters are added for connecting to a Sepolia network. Everything else is the same. And we put a special folder in which the state of the Sepolia network would be downloaded and kept. So now we see that the execution client is running and uh, everything is okay. What is left is to run a Teku, local Teku instance, which is also Java-based by special um, arguments. Again, uh, it would point to the Sepolia network, and we expose the REST APIs for this consensus client, and also 
uh, set an initial state. That's a checkpoint, a remote uh, place where we can download our um, recent Sepoli uh, beacon state, which is saved. That would mean that we would sync with the latest uh, state from Sepoli, not from the beginning, since we want, um, in our example, a fast uh, synchronization. So where we're, when we connect to this uh, remote point, we would start downloading a box from the Sepolia network, as we will see in a minute, that the queue is now running. And we also pointed to the engine API point so that the execution and consensus clients are connected. And now that the consensus client is running, it starts downloading box. It also it um, fetches the execution client connection. And we can uh, see that now the synchronization is starting. And we will download box and propagate them to the execution client. Uh, that would mean that we can run a local Ethereum node, which is entirely built on Java. And if, for example, we don't trust any of the providers which uh, give us access to the blockchain, uh, we can run our own uh, Ethereum node, have our personal account, and uh, send our transaction to our local node, and it would gossip it to the uh, entire Ethereum uh, network. So we have synced the consensus client, which represents the beacon chain. That's the special chain keeping the box themselves. And Let's see what happens in the execution client. It's also connected to the engine API and the consensus client. It starts getting the blocks from there, and it's uh, writing uh, and constructing its own state, which we saw in the diagram, this uh, Ethereum state. So we here, here we can see a progress bar of downloading the state. And yeah, this could take several hours a day, so we might um, get some questions if you have before the third demo. Yes? <laughs> if you want to use interact and interact with the blockchain, uh, you can skip it if you use a provider. That's a lot easier. This is uh, more a bit rare case to run it locally, but you could. And you can also debug operations, test something. That's just an option. But if you want a quick and easy way to interact with the blockchain, there are smart wallets, providers, built-in um, facilities in the decentralized applications. You just connect your wallet, and you have a um, very useful front end with buttons. And it's like a normal experience, but under the hood, we have blockchain. So I wanted to show you the internals of the implementations and the Java usage here, and show that you can run a local Java-based Ethereum node. And that's just one of the ways. And just to mention, uh, Ethereum has also uh, nodes written in other languages, clients from other languages, like Go, JavaScript. So Java is one of the ways. And we have client diversity in Ethereum, so we can run uh, clients with different languages uh, under the hood, but Java would be very useful for performance operations and also enterprise ready um, blockchain based applications. Okay, we have small time for the third demo. I believe it would be faster. So let's get back. Uh, you can scan the Ethereum repository which I showed you. I should update the readme file, but I will do it uh, soon. And the third demo would be about the network which uh, we participate uh, of the development in, which is Hedera. That's uh, another type of DLT, as I mentioned in the beginning, a hash graph based DLT solution. What's interesting is that uh, although it's a hash graph, it has the EVM, which we saw in the first demo, also inside. That's make is, 
makes Ethereum and Ethereum compatible, so we can also deploy and execute smart contracts there. And due to the hash graph algorithm, which is very fast and exponentially we get the information in the whole network, we have very cheap transactions and very uh, fast executions. Here we can see a basic uh, architecture of the Hedero network. We have SDKs on different languages, but also in Java. That's the entry point in which we can interact with the uh, Hedero hash graph. Also, we have different services in the network, but we will stop for uh, the example only for smart contract service. That's a service which can uh, deploy and call contracts. And using such a service, we can then propagate the transaction to the network itself. And Hedero uses another type of uh, protocols, gRPC, the Google types with protobuf messages. So it's a bit different from the JSON RPC for Ethereum, but it also handles JSON RPC requests, which uh, is made by another module in the system, but that's another topic. So a basic transaction flow, we are a client, want to deploy a contract, we use the SDK, we pass the transaction to the gRPC uh, execution, it's sent to the mainnet node, and in Hedera we have also a second type of node called the mirror node. When we execute a transaction, we have a special file with the results of this transaction and how the state was changed there. And this file is supported in a, a cloud bucket. And then the mirror nodes at a regular time download the files from this cloud and normalize the data from the state in a SQL database, Postgre. So we have the mirror node serving as an archive for the whole state of the network. And we are at our last demo. I have another small repository interacting with uh, the Hedero hash graph. We would use the same contract for simplicity. Which is here, we have all the needed resources. And now we would use um, test net network for Hedero as Ethereum. Hedero also has some test public networks and mainnet. Here we would use a test network. We should have again an account to operate with the system. Here I have linked my uh, test account. So we have uh, environment uh, variable. So this is my private key and address, but uh, you can't um, steal anything since uh, it's a test account and it's safe to expose such uh, private keys for the test purposing. So we have the main method and uh, we set up a special client, part of the Java SDK. This client should have uh, information about which network to call. Here we have set the test net uh, network for Hedera. We should set also the operator to communicate with. Um, then we should read the bytecode from the resources. And here is a bit, uh, we have a different step. We should first create a file with a bytecode. After we have this file, we attach it to a contract create Java SDK operation, which gets the bytecode from this file. It deploys the contract. We again have a receipt. From the receipt, we can have the contract address. And then we can call the method via another contract execute transaction. Again, get the receipt and get the result. So after we execute this small demo, we would have a transaction um, hash and the um, contract ID. And we can get more information about them in a special viewing um, a service called HashScan. It can read this public uh, hash graph data for all types of uh, entities like accounts, tokens, contracts. We have now deployed this contract and we can see the create transaction, metadata about it. And that's a public information. It's now stored in the official public testnet network for Hedera. 
And that's how we can interact with the header, which is entirely built on Java. We, both nodes which I showed are built in Java. We have Java SDK. And we can see that we can now have a larger scope of uh, whole network, which is uh, hash graph, but also have box, as we can see here. So it's a mixture of the two. And just to summarize, you can also scan the Hedera small repository. As we saw, uh, Java has its place in the blockchain world. We can build uh, and already have a Java-based TVM, which is the, br the brain of the, a lot of networks, including Ethereum, Hedera, and many others. We can build and run a local instance of a blockchain node written entirely in Java. We can have a whole network, whole DLT network in Java, and we can interact with them using Java SDKs via Web3J library, which is a Java library and can be used for other networks also. And yeah, Java continues to be relevant and has its place in the most modern and actual technologies. Thank you for the attention. You can scan my.